Well, there were three cities in the Lycus Valley, which is in western Turkey, approximately 100 miles east of Ephesus, or about 100 miles east of modern-day Izmir. There was the city of Hierapolis, there was the city of Colossae, and there was the city of Laodicea. Hierapolis was known for its hot springs. Even today, it's a resort. It was approximately six miles from Laodicea. Hot water coming out of the ground. And then there was Colossae. We know about it. We have the letter to the Colossian church. About ten miles from Laodicea. And the Lycus River passed right through Colossae and they had fresh, cold water. But Laodicea, initially built where there were some small streams, had grown in size. And water had become a problem. And they had now taken water from Hierapolis and through aqueducts had brought it down to Laodicea. But it wasn't the hot water that was in Hierapolis. It wasn't the fresh, running cold water that was in Colossae. But it was water that come through the aqueducts. And it was lukewarm. And they well understood the importance in their life of water. Laodicea was also known for its wool, and particularly a shiny black wool. It was a wealthy city. There was a medical university outside of Laodicea that was known for its eye salve and people all over with eye problems came to that medical university. So now as we have this image of hot and cold and lukewarm and rich and clothed and naked, they understood well what the Lord Jesus Christ was speaking to them. See, this is the way the Lord always was. When he spoke to the agricultural communities, he spoke about seeds. He spoke about harvest. He spoke about putting his hands to the plow because he wanted them to clearly understand the imagery. And here, the Lord Jesus used the perfect imagery so that church in Laodicea would understand the earthly message. And it was up to them to apply it and understand the heavenly message. And that should be our goal for this morning. So here, to the angel of the church of Laodicea, write, These things says the Amen, the one who speaks and it is. That's the one who's speaking to them. He's a faithful and true witness. He's the beginning of the creation of God. His testimony is true. If he speaks to your heart this morning through this passage, his testimony is true. He's a faithful witness to the things he sees in the kingdom of heaven. The spiritual truths he sees, we can rely upon. We shouldn't be like those who say, if you're the Christ, come down from there. Save yourself. We know well who he is. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. He's almighty God. And what he speaks, it is. And what he sees is true. I know your works. That you are neither cold nor hot. I would thou was cold or hot. Now, whenever we see this, and every time we go through any of these letters in the church of Reve or in the book of Revelation. Each of them starts out the same way. I know your works, and each time we need to be careful to understand what's he saying. Is he saying we're saved by our works? No, he's not saying he's saved by our works. But what he is saying is our works well testify of what really is inside of our heart. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit. A bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Maybe to illustrate this, Let's look at what Apostle Paul wrote in the book of Romans in chapter 2. And we'll just read a couple verses there. 
And here we see, beginning at verse 6. Let's begin at verse 4 so we at least have most of the sentence. That's the problem with kind of coming into Paul's writing. Some of the sentences seem to be about three paragraphs long. And it's hard to get in the middle. When you get in the middle, you don't know if he's on the main thought or he's on some rabbit trail. But let's begin at verse 4. Do you despise the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? So the Lord waits. He's waiting for us to repent. It's the riches of his goodness that he's long-suffering. But after your hardness and impenitent heart, treasures up to yourself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. He will re render his judgment to every man according to his deeds. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ here would say, I know your works. To them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath. So we can see the two ends of the people. You meet the wrath of God, or you have eternal life, depending upon how you live your life. Now, why does the Apostle Paul say this? Well, he well understood that we're saved by faith. But he understands that faith that truly is faith changes us. God changes us. And if God has changed us, our life testifies that. And this is how we live. We live, verse 7, patiently, continuing, and doing well, seeking for glory of God and honor and immortality in eternal life. That should be the description of how the true child of God believes. Now coming back to where we were in Revelation, I know your works. Don't hide behind what you think you believe. Don't say, I believe and therefore I am. No, if you are, your life will prove it. If you've truly Put your hands to the plow. That plow will be sown, will be making straight lines so that you have a good crop. These things fit together. Now there's a problem with their works. They're not cold. They're not hot. And you would rather they were cold or they were hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. Now let's stop for a minute and think of that word lukewarm. Think of this water that's coming in the aqueducts. It's not the best of water that's serving the people in Laodicea. It's not refreshingly cold. It's not the hot springs, but it's something else. Who are the lukewarm? What are they like? Now, they don't go around with a sign saying lukewarm, do they? No. They tend to come to church fairly regularly. They tend to do things that look good to other people. If I miss church, they're going to ask me where I've been. They're going to ask me why. I'm going to have to come up with an excuse. I might have to lie. I don't want to lie because Christians don't lie. So I'll go to church. When it comes to giving, they give enough to get by. You know, you can't give nothing. You've got to give something. What do you do when, you know, when, when we pass the basket? Everyone's going to notice if I don't put anything in it. And, you know, I'm not going to put my hand all the way in because they might think I'm going to take something out. So I'm very careful to just drop it from the top because I don't want anyone to think that I'm taking something out. We're trying to look good. These are the lukewarm. You know, it's like lukewarm water until you touch it. You really can't tell whether it's hot or cold. Or lukewarm. And this is what the lukewarm looks like. Until you really experience how they react to trials, you really don't know who they are. 
They're lukewarm. They're stagnant. Their Christianity has reached a place of stagnancy. They often face the same trial over and over, maybe in different circumstances, but they never seem to progress from it. They go speak to their pastor, and they seem to have the same problem over and over, and he gives them the same advice time and time again, and nothing seems to change. Their walk is stagnant. They stop progressing in their Christian walk. They've lost focus of 